hope you all had a, a great weekend. It is Monday the 4th of December. So brand new week and what's going to be quite an interesting one in terms of a scheduled perspective. A lot of things going on this week. So, so hopefully we're going to have some good trading opportunities throughout. Um, in terms of an overview then of what we'll cover in the next 20 minutes or so, we'll have a look at some of the week weekend's news. We've got a, uh, a risk on appetite to the market open this morning on the predominant story uh, led by the Senate tax developments, uh, which came kind of early hours of Saturday morning. We've then got a few Brexit things to have a look at, uh, oil as well, with the Baker Hughes rig count, and then we'll have a look at, of course, Bitcoin as well. Uh, there's been some pretty substantial movement seen late last night. So that's what's on the agenda for the, the briefing this morning. But as I said, starting off with a look at the charts, you can see we've had a, a gap up in stock futures here. You can see that looking at the S&P in the center right. So and we're going to talk about this a little bit more after that really big sell off we had on Friday afternoon. Uh, we've gapped up decent amount up to record all-time highs once again at the commencement of Asia Pacific trade so that all-time high now residing at 63 and a quarter uh, and we're sitting here at around the initial peak that was seen towards the the latter part of uh, last week so I guess that would have been Thursday's high at 58.50 uh, so likewise gold gapping down uh, and remaining so about six dollars on the session uh, the dollar gapped up at the reopening of trade in the Dixie, although it's come off slightly, is still up about a third of 1%. So consequently, both major pairs here on the top left are seen lower at present price, down 25 in euro dollar and 16 in cable, albeit just off its worst levels. And then looking at the Bund future this morning, that's also gapped down. So reflective of uh, risk on appetite, and the main reason for that is the Senate tax cut bill in a milestone move towards an overhaul and so this was coming would have been late on Saturday or early hours of Saturday morning, I should say late Friday night Senate Republicans narrowly approved the most sweeping rewrite of the US tax code in three decades slashing the corporate tax rate and providing temporary tax rate cuts for most Americans the vote 51 to 49 uh, 2 a.m. Saturday morning that came in Washington um, so the one thing to keep in mind although this does reflect a progression in these talks and it has prompted many and I saw Deutsche Bank this morning they revised up their number of interest rate hikes they expect for the Fed for 2018 to four from three on the premise that this goes through and will create more of an economic stimulus going into the US into uh, next year. On the back of this as well, what I have seen is the likes of Goldman Sachs. They've said that they see US tax cut boosting growth by around 0.3 percentage points in 2018-19. And they say that US Congress will probably pass tax cut legislation within the next two weeks, ushering in then this boost to economic activity throughout the next two years. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind in terms of the next steps from here this isn't the tax deal signed off. What this is is the Senate have signed it off. Now the bill needs to be reconciled with the House's version, which was already got the nod a few weeks ago. Uh, so there's still some discrepancies though about the actual timing of itself. Um, there is about a year difference, I think it is, between the two chambers of Congress about when they actually want to implement the tax cuts. And then there's some other details as well that still need to be thrashed out. So it's not a done deal, but elsewhere, Donald Trump seems open to negotiated changes on the final bill, noting that the corporate tax rate could be 22% when it comes out, rather than 20%, uh, which could save circa $200 billion over the next 10 years for the budget. So even Trump himself, if you remember, he was the sole person who was initially pushing for 15% cut from 35. Now he's moving even further down the route of compromise in order to get this over the line. He's gone from 15 to 20, now some murmuring about 22% in order to appease all the other politicians on Capitol Hill. So these are all positive signs then that the deal ultimately could well get done. Whether that happens potentially by year end is still yet to be seen. But certainly it looks like the prospects are that this will go ahead at some point in the near future.
And so the market liking that this morning. Before I get on to some of the other stories, though, let's just have a quick review of uh, the S&P here. And in particular, the big nosedive that we're seeing on Friday afternoon. There's a pretty incredible sell-off at the time, and I know that a lot of the guys here trading on the floor in the final stage of the career program made some excellent trades uh, at that point. Now, first of all, why did we have the sell-off? Well, ABC News reported that Mr. Trump's former top aide, Michael Flynn, was re prepared to testify that the president had instructed him to make contact with Russian officials when he was a candidate for the White House. Uh, this, again, was another clear example of the importance of Twitter and social media because that was initially broke on ABC News' Twitter account. It circulated, got the kind of pump, if you like, from the brokers, uh, and then it took a little while for it to build up. But when it really picked up momentum, it snowballed very quickly, and we had a, a progressive move with ever um, more momentum to the downside. And it was a really good move in terms of the usual volatility that we're more accustomed to in the S&P because we fell from around 2650 close to the 2600 handle. Uh, so it's one of the bigger moves that we've seen in recent times. Uh, but after the bell on Friday night, ABC suggested that the story was wrong and that the president directed Flynn to contact Russia after the election result and to discuss topics that included cooperation against ISIS. So a completely different story. Uh, and I think the guy who actually broke the original news is now under investigation himself for, for putting out incorrect and, quote, fake news, so to speak. So uh, that's been brushed aside pretty quickly, and the market's now focusing more so on this situation regarding the Senate uh, tax bill and the positive movements on the back of that. So that sell-off... If you look at it, by the time we got to the close on Wall Street, nearly 100% of that move had already been taken back anyhow. Uh, and now we've gapped even further higher. Other things that we're looking at, of course, are Brexit, because this week is a very important one. We were talking about it a lot last week, about today in particular. Now, what's happened over the weekend? Well, this is kind of the, the flavour of much of the main major headlines. Britain and the EU on the brink of a Brexit divorce deal. I think the Sunday Times uh, at the weekend, they were talking about a deal is about 90% complete, they were suggesting. Uh, Northern Ireland and the future role of European courts in Britain still remain the most sensitive issues. Last minute objections from the Northern Irish Unionist politicians in Belfast to London are now the main potential deal breaker, according to diplomats involved with the matter. We have had a comment about half an hour ago as well on the news feeds saying that UK and Ireland are not close to a breakthrough on the Irish border issue, but progress has been made, according to a foreign affairs minister for Ireland. So still, again, yet, yet to be seen whether or not they can find a solution to this fairly contentious issue. Um, a senior Irish official late at the weekend said they're still awaiting signs of a definitive breakthrough. So by no means yet a done deal, but seemingly they have made some progression over the weekend. Uh, this was a really good article I saw on Reuters looking at the timelines for this week and to give you a bit of clarity on, on what exactly is happening today and then later on this week. So for today you've got European Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker and his Brexit negotiator Michel Barnier. Uh, they're meeting with the Brexit team um, and legis legislature and most ratify any withdrawal treaty and insist EU judges must have final say in enforcing citizens' rights. So basically there's an ongoing European meeting happening in the morning, but in the afternoon, this is when Theresa May will join Juncker and Barnier for lunch, and then this is when the plan is to sign a joint declaration on progression so far in the talks. Now, the question of course being, can this actually happen? So it's in terms of London time, it's 12.15. If you're going to be trading cable and the pound, you're going to have to have your wits about you ahead of that time. I would be mindful of further scoops coming out on the likes of Twitter or the Telegraph have been pretty good at breaking uh, 
uh, the latest leaks and source comments as well. The official lunch zone discussions at 12.15 to add to your calendars. So that's today. Then on Wednesday, you get Juncker chairing the weekly European Commission meeting again with Barnier. Uh, we'll update them then on progress. The Commission could then say if there are sufficient developments to move to phase two. So that would be Wednesday morning, followed by the afternoon, the EU27 envoys meet to prepare a formal decision on sufficient progress for that EU summit, which of course is happening next week on December 15th. So really, today is quite an important day. And I was just mentioning to Vass this morning, today could be a good day for trading in the pound because, let's go back to the chart, the pound has been holding up very well and all things considered given still this lack of real clarity on whether or not we can get a deal done if we just put the pound into a bit of a story over the last week it was the 28th so that was last Tuesday evening that was when we had that telegraph scoop and that they were upping the bill of the divorce settlement fee and since that point cable's gone in the futures here I'm looking at from 132.30 all the way up to highs of around just over the 135.50 uh, mark. So really strong rally. We're looking at you know, almost 250 pips. So how much of this cable move has been priced in that a deal is going to get done? What I'm suggesting then is should a deal not materialize and the negotiators not be able to progress on the issues of let's say Northern Ireland for example then definitely there is scope for in the short term a pretty aggressive pullback down to the 133 handle and then back to what would be key a retest of that 132.30 level again you can see that from the rally from last Thursday and also has provided a degree of resistance during the early and midpoints of November so certainly the risk here, I would say, and what ultimately might provide the more bigger move and, and potential trade could be that we get through to this afternoon and Theresa May really doesn't have much more to update on because they're still stuck in talks without a solution to these key issues to really get the deal fully signed off. And therefore, they can't move to the next step ahead of then the European meetings on Wednesday, which is when all of the 27 countries will then meet to prepare their formal discussions for sign-off to move to trade deals. So this next coming days, and particularly today, could be very important and, and certainly might offer you some opportunities to the downside to trade cable uh, under the right conditions. Okay, so that's Brexit. Let's have a look at a few other things that are going on. Uh, let's take a look at oil because in particular WCI crude is a little bit lower this morning. Well let's just have a bit of a recap because of course we had actually fairly surprising reaction I'd say to the, um, the OPEC announcement. You can see here we had an actual sell-off at the time of the OPEC official press conference this was on that last Thursday, the 30th. However, since that point, we've re rallied quite aggressively. We've actually broken uh, what was the Wednesday high last week, and we got very close up to retesting the, uh, the high that was seen back on the 24th of November, uh, up circa the $59 handle before we've pulled back now. Now, with the price down about 41 cents this morning, one thing for consideration, is that the rig count in the US, uh, as this Bloomberg article headline suggests, counters OPEC curb extension. So don't forget OPEC, as they telegraphed, they've, they've extended their agreement to encompass the entire of 2018 from previous just March 2018. It's an extension to the deal and Libya and Nigeria joined the accord that previously gave them a pass. So that's the, the change. But what's happened is US rigs have risen back to their highest since the end of September. If you'll remember, it was the rig count that actually saw and looked like it was starting to plateau about a month ago. However, it has just picked up slightly. I think the actual US rig count number was up two uh, by Baker Hughes on Friday night. 
It's obviously higher number of rigs returning to market, then this has a, a consequence then for the knock-on effects in the months thereafter for potential US output consideration. And so brings into to contrast then this supply cut to then being negated by returning operational rigs in the US. So a little bit of focus this morning yeah, in some of the headlines. Okay, moving on. Uh, not sure if you guys saw this last night, and I know some of the, the guys in the live room from your own accounts are trading Bitcoin these days. So just wanted to cover this because last night Bitcoin got close to 12,000. And then at about half past eight, half past nine last night, it dropped from about 11,800 or above. It dropped to 10,600, I think it was, within a matter of hours. So we had a really big collapse in the price at its all-time high levels. However, as you can see from that point of a low at around 10,006, it's recovered slowly all the way back up to the current price levels, which are around 11,500. So continue to see high degrees of volatility here in the Bitcoin. So why did it dump first of all? Well, this was the article that it was being pinned on. And really, this is a key risk if you are trading this instrument that you have to be aware of because we've seen the likes of China clamp down on this, terming Bitcoin as an illegal practice, which did see at that time, if you remember, about three months ago, some big downside movements in Bitcoin, albeit it's more than recovered since that point. But this is really what you're looking for now is Western governments to be commenting about potential investigation and then forthcoming regulation into the market. So the Telegraph reported last night a treasury crackdown on Bitcoin over concerns it's being used to launder money and dodge tax. Uh, the treasury in the UK has disclosed plans to regulate, the big, regulate Bitcoin that will force traders in so-called cryptocurrency to disclose their identities and report suspicious activity. And so that's what the, the, the move was at the time. A few things as well to put the current price valuations though in context. As I say, we have recovered and we're getting close to knocking on the door of 12,000. I thought these two graphics were quite interesting. This is looking at the market cap of Bitcoin to the GDP of actual countries. So Bitcoin at the moment has just overtaken in size Romania and New Zealand <laughs> and is now knocking on the door of being the, nearly the same size as Greece <laughs> in terms of its GDP. In terms of companies, Bitcoin is now bigger than PepsiCo, Boeing and McDonald's and almost the same size as Coca-Cola. The final thing that I saw that was quite interesting was this and this here is a graphic looking at the red, the red bars are the Bitcoin bid ask spread and the yellow bars is the gold bid ask spread. So what I'm looking at here is the phenomenal size of the spread in Bitcoin comparative to say gold at the moment. Now one of the interesting things here is that, and what I was talking about last week is that even though Bitcoin has a phenomenally large market capitalization, it is an incredibly illiquid market because of the way in which investors are interacting with this particular asset. If you think about um, the kind of conversations that you've probably had with various different people that you meet, it's talking about where's the best point to get in and purchase Bitcoin. There's not many people talking about um, actual day-to-day -day trading strategies. It's more of a buy and hold uh, scenario. That being said then, it's fairly illiquid because there isn't that minute by minute, day to day, intraday activity. Now, a lot of this might change. One thing that we heard at the back end of last week, we'd actually supported um, some of the price, was that the CME have said that they're going to bring in Bitcoin as of this month. So previously they said it wasn't going to happen to, I think it was the back end of 2018. They said they're going to be ready before the end of this year. I'd imagine from the exchange point of view, they definitely want to capitalize on the current 
um, popularity of this product before maybe something else happens. Um, so some interesting things that have been going on, uh, but this bid offer spread I think was just quite interesting to, to show you why potentially you see such large bounce of volatility uh, in that particular market. Okay, just having a look then, a quick look at the schedule for what's coming out today and as per usual the Mondays in the market do tend to be fairly quiet from a calendar expective or perspective. Um, that is the same today. So the only real data points of some relevance that you have, you've got ISM New York index in the afternoon, uh, you've got durables but these are just revisions coming out of the US so it's pretty quiet. The main thing which we're going to be focusing on is those aforementioned talks between Theresa May and Juncker and Barnier. So that's going to be just after midday London. Looking at the week ahead, um, this is the schedule. I did send this out to you, to you guys this morning. So you've got the RBA interest rate decision, uh, which will be tonight, going to the early hours of Tuesday. You've then got the, the final PMI numbers coming Tuesday as well, um, with the service PMI coming out of the UK, which is always important for the sterling currency. Uh, Wednesday, you get ADP. So this is the commencement then of the run into uh, non-farm payrolls, which we'll get on Friday. Uh, you've also got the ISM non-manufacturing on Tuesday. So looking out for those employment constituents from the Institute of Supply Management. You've got the Bank of Canada rate decision as well. And then from UK side of things, Brexit Minister David Davis addresses Brexit Parliamentary Committee. That'll be on Wednesday. So it's a big week for Brexit this week. Thursday, um, you have another interesting political event to be aware of and something which is kind of secondary to Brexit but equally as important for the euro currency. The German SPD party are holding a convention in Berlin and what is expected is an update on the coalition talks with Angela Merkel's uh, CDU-CSU party. So again this is going to be something the markets are, are looking for as well for progression uh, on talks over that grand coalition. And then on Friday one of the biggest things Aside from US non-farm payrolls, which the current consensus estimate, I believe, is for 199,000, is you have US Congress are set to pass a spending measure in order to avoid a partial government shutdown. Uh, that's important that that happens by the end of the week. It needs to be in place, otherwise we, we're at the risk of a partial government shutdown, but the politicians have been intonating that neither on either side want that to happen. So at this point, the baseline scenario is that that goes through without much issue. So that's your week overall. But again, this is in your inbox if you want to recap. The best thing to do then will be looking ahead and identifying key points of interest. I'd say for sterling traders, definitely today will be big, as will Wednesday. Looking out for source comments throughout, but then Theresa May speaking from midday. Uh, for any traders from the overnight sessions, you've got the RBA interest rate decision on uh, overnight tonight with Canada in the FX markets uh, as well coming with an interest rate decision uh, as well later in the week on Wednesday. And then you've got non-farm payrolls and the associated jobs data coming out with updates to be looking out for on the corporate tax front as well. So a decent week as far as the schedule is concerned. And so I hope that provides you all with some, some good opportunities to trade. Okay, hey guys, that's it. Any questions? Just let me know in the chat room. Sorry, Thanks for allowing me to Otherwise, have a good day and a good week ahead. Thank you very much.